This is the day the Lord has made. We shall be rejoiced and be glad in it. And boy, I tell you, we need to rejoice because if you saw who was beside me, you would be rejoicing and you're getting ready to right now. I tell you what, we got the dynamic duo here tonight. <laughs> Brother uh, Sam Shimon, Brother Robin, Sam. Robin, Robin? I'm yes, so glad that you're here. Praise the God. Robin when you said dynamic Batman. duo, the yeah. Robin to Batman and Robin. Sam yes. Are yes. you saying that... In my case, it's fat man. No, not at all. No, not at all. Uh, I will say that in the Psalms, it says that, you know, those who are blessed will be fat and flourishing. Oh, thank and, you. And so perhaps that does uh, refer to you there, Sam. Oh, thank <laughs> but, you very much. But uh, for David Keep Wood, who's here tonight, Muslims, you just got to love this, you know. Sam Shimon, David Wood, and Pastor Joseph. You got two brilliant apologists and one man who just can't shut up. And I know that you want to call right now, 248-416-1300, because yeah. we got a wonderful show. We're, gonna, we're not afraid, like most Muslim apologists are, of talking about the difficult questions about our own faith, Amen. which, uh, as a matter of fact, would you, dear brothers, agree that the difficult questions actually help us to better explain the exactly. sublime beauty of the gospel of Christ, which is not just in the New Testament, not just in the Gospels, but permeated from cover to cover of God's Holy Word. Amen. We're going to go back to the Old Testament today to look at uh, that which many a Muslim, many a skeptic often likes to bring up, which is to say, well, uh, Jehovah God or, or the God of the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, right. is evil, is unjust. Uh, he promotes uh, genocide and, uh, well, I mean, all sorts of sides, uh, killing, killing babies, infanticide. Uh, and we're going to look at those because, of course, as David is going to point out, uh, one of the qualms we have with the religion of Islam is the violence that is uh, mandated in the Quran and the Hadith, of course, in the Sunnah, the example of Muhammad, who's supposed to be an exemplar for everyone. And, uh, of course, Muhammad, as you've pointed out many times before, wasn't the nicest guy when it came to his enemies or to those who ridiculed him. So, we're going to turn it over to David in just a second, but before I do, I want to remind you that we are right here live, Mubashar in the flesh. This is Jesus or Muhammad <coughs> talking about the idea of violence in the Old Testament. And we look forward to taking your calls. If you have questions about this, Manu, we know you're out there. We're still praying for you to convert to Christianity. We believe you will. It's just a matter of time. Give us a call. Let us know how that's coming. Right now, let's go to Brother David Wood. Well, Pastor Joseph, you bring up an interesting point about us not running from even the difficult issues. Yes. Uh, and w what's interesting is this isn't even... Uh, a central topic for Christians. We right. have we have the New Covenant. We you know e even if we never address the Old Testament, we can right. address uh, the core doctrines. Yes. Uh, so this is kind of a peripheral doctrine, but we're totally willing to address it. As opposed to some of Islam's uh, best apologists, you look at your uh, Islam's best uh, defenders in the West. They're not coming near. Was Muhammad a prophet? They're yeah. not coming near. Is, this, uh, is the Quran the word of God? Yeah, they're and they, they, yeah, like and they will avoid, the <laughs> and they will avoid like the plague. Yeah, uh, the violence in the Quran. They don't yeah. want to address it. If they do address it, they'll 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 have someone on stage who wouldn't dare offend Muslims and doesn't know anything. That's so they they're not gonna they're not gonna come out there and. Uh, uh, and have uh, some of the debaters we know no, uh, no. up on stage. They won't do it. So, and those, and those are the major issues. In Islam, it's, uh, it's, it's was Muhammad a prophet? Is the Quran a word of God? Those are the central issues for proving Islam. Yeah. And as far as people's reaction towards Islam, it would be something like, you know, violence in Islam. And, hey, that, those are the issues we want to, those are the issues we as Muslims want to avoid. Well, sure. uh, that says something. That says something about your position. Whereas... I don't, I don't know, I can't think of a Christian debater, a major Christian debater who would uh, run from, is Jesus God? Or uh, did Jesus die on the cross? Did Jesus rise from the dead? Those are the central issues of Christianity. We're all willing to debate sure, those. Sure. Uh, so we have, we have uh, our core doctrines. We're uh, very happy, and we'd love the opportunity uh, to defend them on stage. And Muslims, uh, not so much with their core doctrines. Uh, but hey, here you have an issue 
that uh, is difficult for Christians. Because if I were in a debate, and this got, this got brought up, if we're discussing um, is Christianity a religion of peace, I'd probably talk a lot about the teachings of Jesus and a lot of, uh, about the teachings uh, of the Apostle Paul and the rest of the other New Testament authors. And I'd point out uh, that we're committed to love everyone, to, to harm no one, to right. pray even for our enemies, to help our enemies, things like that. That's what we're committed. And so if I were in a debate, I'd probably say, hey, this is what Christianity teaches. Of course, there's a religion of peace. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can't brush aside the Old Testament uh, sure. too quickly because we do believe that that is revelation from God. And therefore, everything that's commanded in the Old Testament, we, we can't just say, hey, that's a different God or something like yes. that. We do believe right. those things were commanded hands. by God. And so at the end of the day, we do have to say this. We need to see how this is consistent with our revelation. So Amen. we need to see how the Old Testament is consistent with the New Testament proclaiming one God all along because that is uh, revelation affirmed by our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus yes. uh, told us to live in peace with people, but Jesus also affirmed uh, the Old Testament teachings. And so my brother Sam yes. is How going to take some time. Yep. You, you, can't just, uh, you can't brush over the one or two passages, so Sam's going to go into some detail here. But we're going to look at these Lord passages. Christ. Uh, brother uh, Sam, yes. I would like you just to mention quickly, and Brother David did touch a bit upon it, uh, we have many people out there who are ignorant, uh, whether they're Muslims or Christians or don't know who they are. Uh, the Old Testament, the New Testament, you know, we've had Muslims call yeah. in here saying it's in the Old Testimony, not the New Testimony. But <laughs> what, what is, can you just briefly tell them, uh, a biblical Christian view, a, a New Testament Christian view of the Old Testament? Because yeah. as, you know, there's a lot of differences too. There is some intramural differences. How is the Old Testament binding on us? And I know that there's issues that are much yeah. more detailed than that, but generally, could you speak yeah, that, to that? Well, that would come in later in my discussion All because right. one of the arguments that's brought up <clears throat> to try to prove that these Old Testament commands are still binding on Christians. In mm -hmm. other words, when the Old Testament exhorts the Israelites to wipe out everything that breathes, yes. that's not simply a command for the Israelites. Mm. It's a command that's still binding on Christians, or so the argument goes. And again, <clears throat> when I say... This is the objection. This is the objection brought up by Muslim apologists, mm. uh, especially internet apologists whom yeah. even Muslims don't take seriously. But in yeah. order to try to undermine the credibility of the New Testament or yeah. <clears throat> the so-called peaceful teachings of the New Testament scriptures or justify the violence of the, of the Quran, sure. they say, well, according to your New Testament, all scriptures God breathed. 2 <laughs> Timothy chapter 3, sure. verse 16. No problem. And then they'll argue that contextually Paul was referring to the Old Testament. Okay. And then it says it's profitable for teaching, mm -hmm. for correcting, mm -hmm. rebuking, correcting, and for training in righteousness. And then verse 17 says, so that the man of God may be competent, thoroughly equipped for every good work. See, even the New Testament says the Old Testament is still binding, beneficial, God-breathed. Mm -hmm. You need to look to it for your instruction, for your correction, for your rebuking. So that will come up in my discussion to <clears throat> examine the relationship between the Old and New Testaments, and whether those commands, where God commanded Israelites, wipe out everything breathe, that breathes, yes. meaning women, children, even cattle, yes. are they binding upon the Christians now that the Lord Jesus Christ has come and inaugurated the New Covenant? Because what are the New Testament books? The New Testament books are the inscrip inscripturation of the New Covenant message, the gospel that Jesus brought, yes. And the consummation of the Old Testament that pointed to the coming of Christ and his new covenant right. and his gospel. Right. So that will come up eventually in our discussion. But before I move on, did you want to ask yes, me something else? Yes, excellent, Sam. We look forward to that. And one more thing, Brother David, you mentioned that you would do this. And, uh, of course, uh, most of our viewers, it's easy for us to assume that they know about the violence in Islam and the Quran. But the whole reason that we're bringing this topic up, as you pointed out, Sam, is that we as Christians point to the violence yeah. in Islam, especially the fact that this is the Medinan surahs, the latest surahs, the last commands of Muhammad, the final marching orders, in contrast to the Great Commission, go into the whole world, preach the yes. gospel, right? And make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But in Islam, no. Go and kill the mushrikeen wherever you find them. So would you like to just say, just briefly, for those who may not know, Essentially, what does the Quran teach about today, jihad, violence? Because what we're doing is we're answering a, a comeback from the Muslims that, exactly, yeah. well, uh, yes, it's the, it's the subterfuge, it's the smokescreen. Exactly. Well, sure, we have violence, but look at your violence. It's even more violent. Yeah, yeah. Wipe out mm -hmm. everything that breathes. You, you want to just say some cattle. words on that, David? Yeah, uh, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and give a, a brief overview of the Please. entire dialogue. Uh, we sit down with a 
Muslim and I object to whether Muhammad is a prophet, I say, hey, I don't believe in Muhammad. I think he's a false prophet. Here are my reasons for believing Muhammad's a false prophet. And the response is, uh, shut up, you racist, Islamophobic, hate-filled bigot, something like that. So <clears throat> you're a bigot. You And, and the response uh, would be to accusations that I'm just a racist bigot because I object to Islam. Sure. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. Islam tells you to do something with me. Islam talks about me. Yes. Islam tells you, my Muslim friends, yeah. how to treat me. And therefore, if anyone has a right to say what I think about Islam, I'd say it's me and other Christians and Jews and all unbelievers right. because your religion tells you to do something with us. Yes. And we open up the Quran and we find all kinds of things. Um, the one we probably quote most uh, in here, Surah 9, verse 29 of the Quran. Fight those who believe not in Allah. Fight those who don't believe in Allah. Not fight those <coughs> who attack you first. Fight in self-defense. Fight people because of what they believe. So the passage says, fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger. So uh, in Christianity, um, if... Pork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if, even if, if you eat yeah, pork. Exactly. Christianity yeah. doesn't for, forbid eating pork. Islam does. Therefore, you are not forbidding the same things. Therefore, Muslims are commanded to fight so you. So if I eat a country ham biscuit, a Muslim is supposed to fight me. Yeah, supposed to fight you until you submit. Uh, nor acknowledge the religion of truth. So uh, anyone who doesn't acknowledge Islam as the religion of truth. Well, that's me, that's Pastor Joseph, that's, that's Sam. Right. We don't acknowledge Islam as the religion of truth Amen. because it's not. From among the people of the book, this is not talking about pagans or polytheists, this is the people of the book, that's Jews and Christians. So this is talking about us. Until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Here you have a verse telling Muslims to fight us until we are subjugated to them, paying them money for our own protection. Well, should the spread of Islam concern us? Should this be a worry to us? Here a religion is spreading. Uh, Muslims say, hey, it's the fastest growing religion in the world. Okay, should that be a concern to us when that religion that is spreading rapidly teaches <clears throat> Muslims that once they form a majority, they are supposed to violently oppress and subjugate us? Of course it should. We should be speaking from the rooftops. Wait a minute, we yes. have a problem with this. We have a problem with this, yes. um, with these teachings. Let me read a couple more quick verses and then uh, we'll move on. Surah 9, verse 73. Mm. O prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers. Strive hard against who? People who are um, uh, fighting against you? No, unbelievers. Strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites and be unyielding to them and their abode is hell and evil is the destination. Uh, Surah 9, verse 111. So suppose Muslims say the fight there, the fight there in, um, in Surah 9, 29. Fight the unbelievers. Well, that fighting just means, you know, maybe debating with them. I've had Muslims <laughs> tell me that. No, the, fight, the fighting there, it's not, you know, going out and killing anyone. It's no. just... You know, having peaceful dialogues and discussions, it's a kind of fighting, a kind of intellectual fighting. Mm -hmm. Surah 9, verse 111 defines uh, the type of Islamic fighting that Muslims are supposed to engage in. Surely Allah has bought of the believers their persons and their property for this, that they shall have the garden. They fight in Allah's way. Okay, what's that mean, fighting in Allah's way? It means they're having peaceful discussions. They fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. This is fighting that involves killing and keep, keep on killing until you eventually get killed. And then you get your virgins in paradise. Uh, so we have tons of verses like this in the Quran. 9, 123, O you who believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness. And I'll read one more. Uh, Surah 48, verse 29, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and those who are with him. Who's with Muhammad? The, that would be Muslims, right? Those who are with him are severe against disbelievers and merciful among themselves. You're a Muslim. Who are you merciful towards? Other Muslims. Uh, who are you um, severe against? Unbelievers. So merciful towards other Muslims, not towards, um, towards unbelievers. You find teachings like this all over the place in the Quran. Don't be friends with Jews and Christians. Fight the Jews and Christians. Uh, this says a lot. But when we bring this up, yeah. we say, look at all this, violent, look at all sure. this violence. The response is, ah, but you have things in the Bible. Yeah. And as I pointed out, the, the, the most straightforward response would be, yeah, but the, you know, if you're talking about Joshua being commanded to fight someone, that's not a teaching that applies to me. Right. The teachings that apply to me are the teachings that Jesus told me to obey. Yeah, and all good. of those are to live in peace, to harm no one, things like but that. But that's, uh, that's where the argument comes in. Who tells mm -hmm. you that only applies to them and not to sure. us today? That's part mm -hmm. of the argument. 
Yeah. Uh, but again, in order for me to do justice to this topic, I'm going to need some time, uninterrupted time. Take all the time and, you want. In other words, you do that tomorrow night in an extended. All right, uh, <laughs> Pastor Joe, we're leaving. You're going right. Uh, see you later, buddy. Yeah. We're uh, going to give you an uninterrupted, okay. uh, uh, uninterrupted three minutes. <laughs> go, By the way, right uh, you, one of the references you said, Surah uh, Al Tawbah, chapter nine, verse twenty-three. Yeah. It's actually nine seventy-three. Oh. Well, harsh, I just wanted to, right. those are taking notes. Did I say 23? Yeah, I heard you say 23. Right. It says 73. Right? Thank you, but I heard 23. Face. It's okay. We can make mistakes. Yeah. The good thing is we don't claim to be inspired. I'm going to rewind And we're not it infallible. Say. But, but I'm remember, mistaken, I'm mistaken. Remember, viewers, Surah yeah. Al-Anfal, you know, cut off their yes. heads, cut off their <clears throat> fingertips. Well, uh, they'll say that's only uh, those who fight with you, but you don't do that to women and children. This is oh, why they say nice. that the commands of Muhammad are more humane than the Old Testament injunctions. Sure. Because in the Old Testament, Yahweh said, wipe out everything bre that yeah. breathes, mm -hmm. women and children, and cattle. Mm -hmm. They'll say, our prophet came and says, you only kill those <clears throat> who are fighting you. You do not kill women and children who are not fighting. Yeah. You don't, you don't do that. So they'll say the Old Testament is actually more violent. Now, mm -hmm. with that said, I do want to answer the question because it is a good question. It is something that as Christians who believe in the authority of Scripture, we need to contend with. We can't simply ignore it. And I'm trusting the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and His mercy and the power of His Holy Spirit to enable all of us to speak to this issue with clarity and without error because I do not want to misrepresent the Scriptures or interpret them according to my understanding or liking. So I'm trusting in the Holy Spirit to enable us to glorify Christ by speaking the truth. <clears throat> now, since I'm dealing with a Muslim, and a Muslim criticizes the Old Testament wars, <clears throat> he's either using an internal critique or an external one. <clears throat> what do I mean by that? Either he's looking at the Old Testament commands themselves, and on the basis of what the Old Testament says, condemning these wars as violent. In other words, he's looking at the moral uh, system, the ethical system of the Old Testament, saying, see, even according to the Old Testament, these wars are violent. They're mm -hmm. evil. Okay. Or he's using an external <clears throat> authority. He's appealing to something outside of the scriptures to determine that these acts are evil. Now, as a Muslim, <clears throat> if he's going to appeal to something external to the Bible, obviously he's going to appeal to the Quran and the Sunnah, especially if they're Sunni Muslims. And when we say Sunni Muslims, the majority of the Muslims worldwide do not follow the Quran alone. Both Sunnis and Shiites follow the Quran, as well as <clears throat> the life of Muhammad and the example of Ali, Right, if you're a Shiite. And much of that is not found in the Quran. It's found in what we call the Hadith literature. It's found in the Sirah, the biography on the life of Muhammad and his family. So a Muslim, if he wants to know whether something is good or bad in the eyes of his God, he has to appeal to the Quran or the Sunnah. Mm -hmm. so that's his external critique. Now, when I appeal to the Quran and the Sunnah, I just want to qualify this, lest the Muslims think that I'm using Muhammad to prove the justice of these wars. From a Christian perspective, Muhammad is a false prophet. Yes. I know that may be offensive to Muslims, but I have to speak the truth. And according to the scriptures, Muhammad contradicts the core essential teachings of the gospel, denies that Jesus, son of God, denied that he died on the cross, rose again, <clears throat> sits enthroned as king of kings and lord of lords. Therefore, he's not a true prophet. He's a false prophet. Right. However, since this is a Muslim objection and they believe whatever Muhammad says, I'm appealing to his instructions to show that even on the basis of Muhammad's commands, they have no basis to condemn the Old Testament mm -hmm. because in condemning the Old Testament, they're condemning Muhammad. Yes. What do I mean by that? Those Muslims who have Tafsir ibn Kathir, and by the way, if you don't have it in your library, I recommend that you go to the following website to read this comment for yourselves, Muslims and non-Muslims. Go to www.tafsir.com. Check out Ibn Kathir's commentary on chapter 5, verse 41 of the Quran. I'm going to read a portion of it because it tells us that Muhammad, at, the, at his time, appealed to a copy of the Torah in the possession of the Jews. And in a, instead of saying that your copy has been corrupted, there is some truth in it, but much of it has been corrupted, Muhammad actually testified to its textual veracity, confirming all of it, not some of it. Let me read that portion. Abu Dawood, and this comes from Tafsir ibn Kathir, <clears throat> Abu Dawood recorded that Ibn Umar said, some Jews came to the Messenger of Allah and invited him to go to the Kuf area. So he went to the house of Al-Midras and they said, O oh, Abu Qasim, he had a son named Qasim, so they said, O oh, father of Qasim, a man from us has committed adultery with a woman. So decide on the matter. You tell us what we should do, what the punishment should be. They arranged a pillow for the Messenger of Allah, and he sat on it and said, Bring the Torah to me. Notice, 
Pastor Joseph, he's appealing to their copy of the Torah yeah. that was available yeah. in the 7th century AD. And this is in Bukhari as well. I mean, well, he's bringing Bukhari, it from yeah, there. Bukhari yeah. says, what does it say in the Torah? Yeah. Same circumstance. Yeah. Muhammad says, what does your Torah say? Yeah. And the Jews try to cover it up. Mm. But there was a Jew who supposedly converted to Islam and says, you know what? Because one guy had put his hand over the command of stoning. Right. He goes, remove your hand. Yeah. Read it. Yeah. So he's appealing to their Torah. But now notice yeah. the interesting part. Notice what he says here. He was brought the Torah. He removed the pillow from under him and placed the Torah on it saying, I trust you yes. and he who revealed it to you. Yes. yes. Did you catch that? Yes. Now, here's the dilemma for the Muslims who attack the Old Testament wars as violent, as bloody, as merciless. Mm -hmm. The copy that, of the Torah that the Jews had would have contained these stories of Old Testament wars, or what mm -hmm. some Muslims like to call genocide, uh -huh. using emotive terms to get people to react emotionally. Sure. Now, if <clears throat> Muhammad was truly against these Old Testament wars and <coughs> thought they were in, unjust, why in the world is he confirming the Torah, which contains such injunctions, why doesn't he say anything about these Old Testament wars? He says, I trust you, not parts of you, mind you. I trust you and him who revealed you. So Muhammad is confirming all that the Torah teaches, including the Old Testament wars. Therefore, Muslims, anytime you attack the Torah because of its so-called violent teachings, you're saying Muhammad is a false prophet. And we do agree he is a false prophet for other reasons. Here he was right. The Torah is the word of God. But in condemning the Old Testament, you're condemning your prophet. You're also condemning the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. And again, I want the audience to write these verses down because we do not have time to go through all of them. There, there's a quick point just for clarification, Sam, to remind our viewers. The Old Testament that we have today would be identical Precisely. to the Old Testament in And I'm going to actually time. show that from showing Jesus' yes, example please. because yeah. the Dead Sea Scrolls are a very important witness yes. to what the Old Testament looked like. Yes. And there's no doubt it's virtually identical to what we possess today. Yes. I, and I want the audience to write these verses down, and I have to go through the external critique real fast to show that Muslims have no business attacking the Old Testament, because then I want to deal with the justice of these wars from the biblical perspective. Because even though yes. I can disprove the Muslim argument, sure. silence it by the grace of God, still there are Christians who could care less what Muhammad thought about the Bible, right. and they still want a satisfactory answer. And Lord willing, I hope we can provide one. Yeah. Our time is fleeting. I hope we can get to it. Yeah. Really, if not, we're going to have to do part two tomorrow. Go now, because we okay. don't have any callers. Okay, chapter three. <laughs> The, write these down. I won't be able to read all of them. Chapter 3, verses 3 to 4. Chapter 3, verses 3 to 4 of the Quran. <clears throat> Chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. Chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. Chapter 7, verse 157. Chapter 7, verse 157. Chapter 10, verse 94. Chapter 10, verse 94. And chapter 61, verse 6. 61, 6. Now, why did I give you all these passages? All of these passages confirm... That part of Jesus' mission and Muhammad's mission included confirming the scriptures available to them mm -hmm. as the uncorrupt words of God. In fact, in one passage, we're told that if we doubt the revelations of Muhammad, ask the people who've been reading the Bible, the book before him. Yeah. Why in the world would Allah ask people to, to ask Jews and Christians to verify the Quran by appealing to their scripture if their scripture is corrupt and not completely authentic? And he's but, probably telling Muhammad to do it. Yes, because Muhammad was doubting, and yeah. also those, yeah. by extension, doubt as well. But here's the, here's the most important passage, chapter 5, verse 46. Here's the most important passage, and then, Lord willing, I can move on into the eternal critique. Chapter 5, verse 46. And we sent, following their footsteps, Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming the Torah that is between his hands, musaddiqan, sadaqa, lima bayna yadayhi, between his hands. In other words, this is an idiom, Referring to the scriptures that Jesus has had access to at his time. It says he came to confirm it, not to attack its textual veracity. Historically, we know that the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus would have confirmed are the same Old Testament scriptures we possess. And now, how do we know this? Well, number one, we have copious references in the New Testament where Jesus is appealing to the Old Testament as we possess it today. That's number one. Number two, with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, copies of the Old Testament were furnished, copies that were made roughly 200, 200 years before the birth of Christ. And these copies show us that the Old Testament that Jesus would have access to is virtually identical to what we read today. Therefore, if this passage is true, and Muslims believe it is, Jesus confirmed the Old Testament and the Old Testament wars that were prescribed in it. 
So for a Muslim to say that these war wars are violent, genocide, merciless, mm -hmm. you're not just condemning Jesus, you're not just condemning Muhammad, you're condemning your God for sending Jesus and Muhammad to confirm those scriptures which contain these commands. Everyone with me? Yes. I hope that was clear. Yes. But it gets juicier, Joseph. Mm. It gets even better. Chapter 2, verses two, uh, chapter two verses 246 to 252. Now, I can't read all of that. Let me summarize what this says. In chapter 2 of the Quran, verse 246 to 252. Number 246 to 252. I'm getting tongue-tied. Too many twos there. I do, dot, 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 dot. No. Chapter 2 of the Quran. Here, Muhammad makes allusion to the Old Testament wars carried out by Saul, mm -hmm. called Talut, mm -hmm. David, and their wars against not just the Amalekites, but the Philistines. How do I know the Philistines? Because in this passage, there's a reference to Galut, which is the Arabic word for Goliath. Mm -hmm. Here, Muhammad says that these wars, these expeditions carried out by Saul and David, some of which included wiping out everything that breathes, mm -hmm. were prescribed by the same God who supposedly revealed the Quran. Why in the world is Muhammad confirming these Old Testament wars if Muhammad thought these wars were atrocities committed against humanity? Can you help me understand that, Pastor Joseph? No, Why no, would I... remember the Muslim argument is these are this is genocide, you know, this is evil. And there's one Muslim apologist who I can mention, Nadir yeah. Ahmed, who says, you know, that Islam came to save us from the genocide of the Bible. <laughs> You actually came to save us from Muhammad who believed that these wars were not genocide, but just wars carried out justly against sinners who deserved it. Would the more subtle uh, Islamic apologists say, well, actually, uh, Muhammad is more like those Old Testament uh, leaders who fought those wars? Well, They're we can like, get to that because okay. that assumes that yes. Muhammad was carrying out orders given by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay. And the evidence is he's a false prophet. Right. That's why I say, even if he says the Old Testament is true, it holds no weight for us. Right. But since it's a Muslim arguing this, I'm using his authority Very against good. him. Yeah. Right? And then, again, Sahil Bukhari. This mm. one is really, mm -hmm. I really love this one. Yes. Sahil Bukhari, Volume 4, Volume 4, write down the reference. And by the way, you can read Bukhari online for free. Mm -hmm. Sahil Bukhari, Volume 4, Book f uh, 53. In the old version, it's number 353, number 353. They updated it, and it's a different numbering system. But this you can find online, number 353. Guess what Muhammad did? He confirmed the Old Testament instructions in Deuteronomy 20, and he confirmed Joshua's wars to wipe out the Amorites, and he confirmed that the sun stood still when Joshua did so. It's all in this hadith. Let me read it. Yes, please. Okay. Narrated Abu Huraira. The prophet said, a prophet amongst the prophets carried out a holy military expedition. Mm. So he said to his followers, and by the way, here he's quoting Deuteronomy 20, verses 1 to 9. He's here, he's alluding to Deuteronomy 20, verses 1 to 9. Anyone who has married a woman and wants to consummate the marriage and has not done, uh, done so yet should not accompany me. That's Deuteronomy 20. Right, okay? right, right. Nor should a man who has built a house but has not completed its roof, nor a man who has sheep or she camels and is waiting for the birth of their young ones. This is Deuteronomy 20, verses 1 to 9. Now watch this. So the prophet carried out the expedition, and he re reached that town at the time, or nearly at the time of the Asr prayer. He said to the son, O son, you're under Allah's order, and I'm under Allah's order. O Allah, stop the sun from setting. It was stopped till Allah made him victorious. Mm. This is an allusion to Deuteronomy 20, verses 1 to 9, mm. and Joshua's expeditions against Ai and the king of Jerusalem found in Joshua chapter 7 and Joshua chapter 10. Guess what, Pastor Joseph? Yes. These are the very chapters in which Joshua is carrying out God's order to wipe out everything that breathes. Yes. And Muhammad says, Allah helped Joshua do it. Yes, yes. Do you understand the dilemma that the Muslim is in right now? So it's impossible for a Muslim to be consistent and to condemn these things. Precisely, because he condemns Muhammad. Right. Now again, they should reject Muhammad, but not for this reason. Right. Finally, and then I'm going to go into the internal critique if I have time, or if yes. you want to take a question, I'll come back to it. Yes. Finally, finally, <clears throat> it is ironic that the Muslims have no problem with the Quran confirming Old Testament stories such as God destroying Sodom and Gomorrah by fire mm -hmm. or destroying Noah's people by flood right. because a Muslim will be, will be forced to admit 
that when God did it, yeah. he didn't discriminate. He wiped out everything mm -hmm. from the infants to the children to the women to the right. cattle. Right. You know what? One Muslim apologist told me, and I can mention him by name because yeah. Lord will now be debating him on this topic and yeah. showing him why he condemns Muhammad, and rightfully so, but not for this reason. Nadir Ahmed told me recently when I asked him, did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah by fire? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yet you have a problem with God commanding soldiers to kill people by the sword, but you have no problem with God destroying even infants by fire? Mm -hmm. You have no problem with God sending yeah. fire to consume not right. just the, the combatants, right. women, children, and cattle? Everything. You don't have no problem with God flooding an entire town, including infants? No, because as long as he doesn't use soldiers with swords. And you know what's ironic? Chapter 11, verse 102, the Quran says this. Chapter 11, verse 102. Such is the seizing of thy Lord. This is chapter 11, verse 102. It's talking about when Allah destroys evil cities and towns. Notice how he destroys them. Does he destroy them mercifully? Watch. Such is the seizing of thy Lord. When he seizes the cities that are evil doing, surely his seizing is painful, terrible. Mm, mm. Now, Dave, let me ask you a question. Here the Quran says that when Allah destroys an entire city and all its inhabitants, He doesn't do it in a pleasant manner. He makes sure it's very painful. Wouldn't this imply that Allah even destroyed infants, women, and cattle in a very painful, terrible manner? Sounds like it. And yet the Muslim has a problem with the Old Testament war? So now, their external critique, they have nothing outside of the Bible by which they can use to condemn the Bible. Right. The Bible. In fact, their source of morality confirms the justice of these wars. So it cannot be an external critique. Now, Go right ahead. there. Now, we have a caller, yes. but uh, anyone who will just be a Muslim, who will be honest with himself, can see that from Islam, it would be impossible, entirely inconsistent to, uh, to condemn. What we find in the Old Testament, because they would not only be condemning that which Allah hath decreed according to the Quran, but also what Muhammad had recounted and what Muhammad gave credence to, particularly in the hadith of saying, I believe you and everything that is inside of you, and what Jesus confirmed according yes. to the Quran, which was the Torah. And we have, as you said, the very same Torah today as we did in that exactly. time and in the time of Muhammad, and we have the proof of that. So there's, that argument is gone. Now, a little bit later on, I want you to go further, as you said because you would. Because now I want to show that it's thoroughly just from the Old Testament and Absolutely. New Testament themselves. Absolutely, because, yes, we'll of course, here. I can hear the Muslim apologists, you know, saying something to the effect of, well, you know, Muhammad is justified. This is the same thing as what Muhammad does. No, it's not. Exactly. No, it's not, because, of course, if it is, because then you have our to critique, factor in Jesus. Our critique of Islam, exactly, our critique of Islam would be invalid. If, if, what, if what Deuteronomy ha says is the same exactly as what Muhammad is doing and what the Quran says in Surah Al-Tawbah, Surah Al-Anfal, then our critique of Islam as being violent is worth... Yes, and, and I'll and show I, that yeah. is there's no comparison. We're call, uh, comparing apples and pineapples. And one important difference real yes. quickly. If you go back to the Old Testament wars, yeah. when God used Israel to wipe out the Amorites, yeah. it's because these people were so wicked. For right. 400 years, they continued in their sin. I'll get to that. He told Abraham. Once when they're wiped out, they entered the land, they had no right to attack any other nation. Right. God told them, you cannot attack anyone else unless they attack you. He and if they attack the you, you kill the men, but not the women and children. So this was only limited to a specific area, a and land a that they were going time. to own. And dispossessed the evildoers there. Yes. And it was only for that area. They couldn't then spread the rule right. of Judaism right. to the rest of the world no. like Islam does. So right. we're comparing apples and pineapples, but right. I have a lot more to and, say. And about. one more general point you mentioned before we get to the caller. They always love to leave Jesus out of this reckoning. Yes. The, when he comes, the, things are different. They always want to compare Muhammad to Moses or Muhammad <laughs> to Abraham, yeah. but they don't like what's on the wall, Jesus or Muhammad. Yes. You know, you just ask yes. a Muslim, well, now tell me, Mr. Muslim, how, how many wars did Jesus fight? Yeah. How many uh, people... Oh, but wait, he was the God of the Old Testament, right? Wasn't it him? <laughs> See, that's, what, that's another argument that they bring up. Right. See, you're saying Jesus is Yahweh, so Jesus is the one who killed these innocent babies. Yes, yes. And I'll get course. to that. Good, After the very caller, good. Lord willing, I'll get to that. Very good. All right, let's take the first caller right now. Welcome, you're on the air with Jesus or Muhammad. Hello. Yes, yes hello, hi. you're on the air. This is Philip speaking. Welcome, hi, Philip. Hi, Philip, how are you? Uh, fine, thanks. Uh, I'm proud. Of, I'm participating in your program. I think maybe about the uh, uh, fourth or fifth time. 
And Welcome. Uh, oh, praise Go. God. Your first time and caller? I to greet you all in the precious huh? name of our Lord oh, and Savior Jesus Christ. We, we thank you and we greet you as well in that glorious name, the name Amen. above all Amen. names, the name of Lord Jesus. Go Lord. right ahead with yeah. your question or comment, brother. It, uh, my, uh, first, my comment is an attack on the Bible is an attack on the Quran. Mm. Muslims should understand that an attack on the Bible is an attack on the Quran. That's right. You know, Muslims uh, are ready to attack the Quran in order to put Christianity to lift up Islam. This is a great thing for Muslims. What did you say? Yeah. You're and, cutting off, Philip. Yeah. Uh, 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 as uh, uh, Brother Sam Shimon had uh, quoted, the uh, 10th chapter of the Quran, Surah Yunus 9, says, If Muhammad, if you have any, go with me. Bro and then clarify up, yeah. Bro Brother like Philip, could you please call back? You're breaking yeah. up, and we can't get your transmission. But yeah. Surah Al-Yunus 1094, as Brother Sam said, of course, and we mentioned to doubt, Muhammad, yeah. if you are in doubt of yes. what we revealed and to so you. so by extension to anyone else. To if anyone else. To Muhammad, yes. I know we have, a, we have another call. However, uh, do you want me to finish internal critique before we take the other caller? Uh, we do have one more caller. Is that correct? Okay. Let, let's go ahead and take okay. that caller real quickly. Right. Let's take the next caller right now. Yeah, Welcome here on I the have. air with Jesus or Muhammad. Hey, what's up? This is Liz from Toronto. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, um, I'm, I'm just a little confused. So Nadia Ahmed has a problem okay. with the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, but I thought that exact same story appeared in the Quran. So why would he be that appears in his belief as well? Okay, we got the question. Thank you. You're breaking you up a little bit. Let me repeat the question. No, 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 that's not what I said. I said Nadir has a problem with uh, God using human agents to kill people by the sword. Right. That's why when I cornered him in, in the room, Pal Talk, I cornered him and I said, do you admit that the Quran confirms that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah by fire? He goes, yes. So then you don't have a problem with God killing even infants and women by fire, but you have a problem with God using human agents to kill them by the sword? Mm. You're very consistent. Right. Obviously, he's being inconsistent because, again, he cannot refute the arguments against him. So, no, he's not denying Sodom and Gomorrah. He's saying, oh, that's okay. God wants to destroy people by yeah. flood and fire. Okay, as long as he doesn't use human beings. Yeah. Well, what, especially, I mean, how arbitrary can you get? Especially right? the Jews. Yes. Thank you, dear caller. Brother Sam, go can right I, ahead. Okay, now, yes. the, now yes. how do we justify these Old Testament wars in light of the biblical teaching, especially the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ? You have 11 well, minutes. Go okay, right well, ahead. Ho hopefully, in Jesus' name, I can do, go do wonders in 11 minutes. Well, obviously, our Lord, by confirming these, uh, the Old Testament, confirmed these wars and saw that they were thoroughly just. Mm -hmm. So Jesus saw the justice in them. Now, how can they be just? Well, if you really want to see the justice behind God, commanding Israelites to wipe out everything that breathes, even infants, mm -hmm. you don't start looking at Exodus or Deuteronomy. You need to go back to Genesis chapter 15, yes. verses 20, 12 to 21. Genesis 15, 12 to 21. There you're going to actually see how merciful and compassionate God truly is. Mm -hmm. And you'll see it. When you read Genesis 15, 12 to 21, God makes a promise to Abraham saying, 400 years from now, don't forget, 400 years from now, in the fourth generation, your descendants will come and inherit the land. Why will it take 400 years before they inherit the land? Genesis 15, verse 16, tell us. Now notice this. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites, the inhabitants, is not yet complete. Notice what God is saying. I'm going to wait 400 years until they reach the full measure, measure of their sin. Yes. What we learn from this passage is that God has a limit to how much sin he will tolerate. How much sin he will tolerate. If you want to understand some of the sins that God tolerated for 400 years, understand the implication. Each new generation of Amorites, because they were born as infants, grew up to continue the wickedness of their parents before them for 400 years. Mm -hmm. If you want to understand some of their wickedness, go to Leviticus chapter 18, read the entire chapter. Leviticus 18 verses 1 to 30, God tells them, that I'm going to bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Canaanites, and they're being thrown out of the land because of these sins. Some of the sins listed, listed are bestiality, humans sleeping with animals. God tolerated such sins for 400 years. Incest, father sleeping with daughter, son sleeping with mother. <clears throat> Not only that, 
offering their children to Moloch as a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So for 400 years, God put up with infanticide, God put up with incest, God put up with homosexuality, lesbianism, and bestiality. 400 years, God in his patience tolerated it. And then notice what he says near the end of the chapter. He says to them, to the Israelites, but you must keep my decrees and my laws. The native born who's an Israelite or a non-Israelite, an alien who wants to worship me and live with you, must not do any of these detestable things. For all these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomit out the nations that were before you. Did you catch it? Yes. The land itself got so disgusted with the evil that the land threw them out. So let me ask you a question, Pastor Joseph. Notice, for 400 years, each generation of Amorites, each newborn, grew up to continue in the footsteps of the wickedness of their parents. In light of that parent uh, pattern, would God be thoroughly just to even wipe out infants whom he knew would grow up to continue the wickedness of their parents before them? Absolutely. Would he be just? Absolutely. So here is where the deception lies. The deception is God is killing the innocent. No, he's not. Let me give you an example, and I'll actually show you the Quran confirms this principle. The yes. Quran agrees with what I'm about to say. Even Hitler was a baby. Mm -hmm. So was Saddam Hussein, mm -hmm. Genghis Khan, you name it. Yeah. They were babies, and when you looked at them, you saw an innocent infant, or so you think. Mm -hmm. Yet these, these infants turn out to be monsters right. committing genocide. Yes. Would God have, have been just mm -hmm. in killing them in their infancy in light of how they turned out? Yes. But it's a situation, and damn, damn if you do, damn if you don't. God is then condemned if he does kill them in infancy in light of their future. But if he allows them to live on and carry out their atrocities, he's still condemned for allowing them to live and carry out those atrocities. Right, right. So it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Now, 1 Samuel 16, 7 tells us God doesn't see simply an infant. He sees a potential rebel sinner who, apart from grace, will inevitably rebel against them and therefore deserves the judgment that he receives. Yes. 1 Samuel 16, 7. Let's read this. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance. Don't look externally. Because he saw Jesse's firstborn. And Samuel said, Man, this got to be the king of Israel. He's handsome. Look at him. He's buff, right? Looks like David. Looks like David. Yep, that's right. right. Yahweh says, No, it's not him. Do not look on his appearance. Do not look externally and see an infant before you or on the height of his stature, because I've rejected him. For Yahweh sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but Yahweh looks on the heart. Tie it in with this passage, Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately sick. Who can understand it? If Yahweh looks at the heart, what does he see? He doesn't see a heart that's pure and ready to worship God. He sees a heart that's dead, and ready to rebel against God the moment that infant grows up to distinguish between the right or wrong. And that's for In every fact, man. do me a favor, Pastor Joseph, don't mm -hmm. me to cut you off because our time is fleeting. Go ahead. Read Genesis 8, 20 to 21 for me, brother. Genesis 8, 20 to 21. Yes. Right. Read that for me. It says, Then Noah built an ark, uh, an altar. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, mm -hmm. although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. From when? From his youth. The intentions of the heart of man is evil from youth. Yes. David takes it a step further. Yes. My mother conceived me in sin. Yes. Psalm 51, verse 5. So yes. let's tie this all together. And I'll read one passage from the Quran, then we can take calls, because then I wanted to also discuss the Old Testament relationship to 2 Timothy 3, mm -hmm. if we have time. If sure. not, we'll wait. Sure. <clears throat> now, there you see what God says. He looks at the heart. God also testifies that a heart of every human being is corrupt. It's evil from when? From his youth. From his youth, from infancy, from childhood. Yes. Therefore, yes. let's tie it in. 400 years God waited patiently for the Amorites to reach the full measure of sin. Yes. What does that tell you? God knew 400 years in advance, these yes. people won't repent. Right. They will reach the full measure of their sin. 
when then I have to act and destroy them justly. See, yes. God is even telling Abraham, yes. you're going to get this land because I'm telling you these people won't repent. Right. 400 years later, they're going to add sin upon sin until the limit of their sin is complete. Then I have to act in justice and destroy them. Yes. The implication is every new generation of Amorites, Canaanites, born as infants, grew up to be just as wicked as their parents before them. Therefore, when they reached the full measure of their sin, was God thoroughly just in even destroying the infants, knowing their outcome before it happened? Absolutely. And even if they weren't to be uh, uh, evil in their sins, He would still be just. Yes. Amen. And we agree. But again, from the biblical perspective, yes. we know our God doesn't delight in destroying, but saving. Right. Right. But apart from grace, they cannot come to salvation. And Amen. God is not obligated to give anyone grace. Amen. And in case a Muslim doesn't like that reasoning, which again, if he doesn't like it, that's between him and God. Yes. But if he doesn't like it, that means he condemns Muhammad again. Yes. Why do I say that? The Quran agrees that God is just in even killing an infant or a child who seems to be innocent on the basis of his knowledge that this child will grow up to be evil. What am I talking about? The story of Moses and Al-Khidr, the green one, mm. who killed a youth. Mm. Let's read Surah 1874 and Surah 18, verse 80. Okay. Surah 18, verse 74 and Surah 18, verse 80. Let's read Moses' reaction when he saw this servant of God who's supposed to be knowledgeable killing a youth whom Moses thought was innocent. Externally, he's innocent, man. Why are you killing him? Let's read it, 1874. So they journeyed until then when they met a young boy. He slew him. Moses said, what? Have you slain an innocent person without his having slain anyone? Surely you have done a hideous thing. Sounds like Nadir Ahmed, huh? But then Surah 1880, notice the response of the servant of God. Surah 1880. As for the youth, his parents were believers, and we feared lest on growing up he would involve them in trouble through rebellion and disbelief. Mm. Did you see why he killed them? Not because of any sin he committed, because of sin that he would eventually commit. Mm. And even this passage shows he's not certain he will. Right. We fear he will do this. Mm. So on the grounds of the possibility that he would turn evil and mislead his pa parents, he was killed. Mm. Mm. So if the Quran says that God can even kill someone who seems to be innocent because he knows his outcome, on what grounds can you say that the Old Testament wars are unjust? When we see God's patience, was God not being patient and showing mercy to generation upon generation of sinners who were committing bestiality, infanticide, incest? Wasn't that actually mercy on God's part, not wiping them out from the very beginning? I think it was. Therefore, God is thoroughly just in what he does. Excellent, Brother Sam. We're going to go to a break and come back to get the callers that are waiting. i just like to add one point, not to improve, but just to add, because I can't improve upon what you have said simply to say this, the justice of God, I think, is ultimately shown in that he did the very same thing to his own people. Exactly, Israelites. And he even said that in the chapter. The very you same thing. You do it, thing. you're out too. And that's exactly yeah. what he did to the nation of Israel exactly. uh, in, the, in the 8th century B.C. and to the nation of Judah in the 6th Amen. century B.C. He's a fair God, impartial God. This is Eight justice, seven. ultimate yeah. justice. And Muslims, when you go before the throne of God, there's no curve, there's no scale where give me one and I'll get ten. There's no lucky lotto to get you to heaven. It's Jesus Christ and Him alone. Let's take a break. We'll be right back to get your calls and more of Jesus or Muhammad. like to support ABN's ministry, you can give us a call at 248-416-1300 or you can visit our website at www.abnsat.com. ABN appreciates your support and donations. Are you a Christian who loves watching ABN shows? Are you eager to make a video and post it online and see it reach millions of Middle Eastern people? Or are you a Muslim who wants an outlet to ask questions, make comments, or post video responses to Christian evangelists and apologists? Well, ABN Tube has it all. ABN Tube is an extended media outlet of ABN TV ministry. 
We've gotten an overwhelming response from viewers of ABN to launch a media outlet for people like you to upload your own video responses to some of the clips we have online, whether on ABNSAT.com or on our ABNSAT YouTube account. Our goal is to bring to light any and all lies about false religion through media to create an open dialogue about religion among people of different faith and to gear them to the truth of Jesus Christ. Please visit our site at www.abn2.com. Thank you. If you would like to watch a show you recently missed, or would just like to browse our live show directory, we encourage all of our viewers to go to our four YouTube channels. You may find our four YouTube accounts by typing www.youtube.com slash abnsat or slash English gospel or slash Arabic gospel or slash Aramaic gospel. We appreciate all of your support and prayers, and if you have any questions or comments, please visit our website at www.abnsat.com or you can call us at 248-416-1300. You are watching ABN. Praise the Lord. Welcome back to Jesus or Muhammad. Hey, I tell you what, this is a great night, and uh, we thank God for his son, Jesus Christ, <laughs> who's here right now with us, though you may not see it, because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake Amen. you. And he in also said, where two or three or two or more gather together in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. Hey, we're here in the name of Jesus. We're not here in the name of Muhammad or Terry Jones or anybody else. We're here in the name of Jesus Christ. And of course, Muhammad is dead. Jesus is alive. Muhammad is in hell burning. And Jesus is at the right hand of God. God the Father making intercession for the saints forevermore. What a blessed, wonderful Amen. promise. Amen. And, and uh, I just want the callers to uh, be encouraged to know that the justice of our God, our God is so holy, is so perfect, is so righteous. There is no sin that can abide in His presence. The God of Islam is a weak God, is a pushover God. You can have sin, you can have orgies, you can have homosexuality, you can have all sorts of things. 72 virgins upon 72 with swelling breast and everything else you want to put in the Hadith and in the <laughs> Quran. No problem, yeah. no problem. Everything forbidden on earth is allowed in heaven. Alcohol out the wazoo, if you please. Yeah. I mean, anything and everything. But for God, that land, by the way, Sam, and I know you can mention this later, that holy land, if you will, and it is the holy land, even in the Quran, yeah, this exactly. is a special land given to Banu Israel. Surah 5, 20 to 25 says it's for the Banu Israel, Moses. In fact, uh, it even talks about how the Israelites complain, said, let your God and you go fight for, for the land. Did, Surah 5, it, 20 to 25. Here's another That's apologetic for you. Yes. Muhammad's last orders. Yes. Let there be no other religion in Arabia. That's right. Nine, in other words, yeah. kill, yeah, expel, fight anyone nine, but Muslims. Exactly. Sir now, nine, now, now, is this not, a, in a sense, what God was telling the Israelites for yes. that small please? Yes. May nothing. So you won't be defiled. Yes. Uh, defile, uh, well, even an animal. That's the whole idea. Nothing. Kill everything that breathes. Yes. It wasn't because God is sadistic. It was because of His utter holiness 
that even those animals that would have been used in, in the sacrificial system to yes. these pagan gods yes. would defile the land. But Muslims cannot begin to understand true Yahweh, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because they bow down to a black stone five times a day and this Allah that I don't even know exists the agnosticism of Islam into which Muhammad is vacuumed up into and he becomes essentially equal to Allah, they do not have a holy, righteous picture of their God. The Allah of Islam is too small, is too weak, and he allows sin in his presence. Yep. In fact, uh, what's ironic, you just said that God even killed the cattle because it was defiled. That's even in the Hadith. Muhammad yeah. says if a man is caught sleeping with an animal, a yeah. beast, Kill the man and the animal. That's in the Hadith. Amen. So again, when Muslims condemn our, our, our scriptures for these teachings, they're condemning Muhammad. But from a Christian perspective, it's irrelevant what Muhammad believes. Yes. Muhammad could say the Old Testament is true, and the reality is that it's corrupt. Maybe the evidence suggests it is. The only reason why I'm appealing to it is because it's a Muslim attacking the Old Testament. Yes. If I'm arguing with an atheist, I'll never quote Muhammad. Right. My right. argument to the atheist would be different. <clears throat> what are you using to condemn? Sure the Old Testament wars. In your worldview, what is the standard that you're using to determine that this is truly evil? In an atheistic worldview, that, that argument is self-defeating in the sense that he doesn't believe in moral absolutes. So he's basing it on his subjectivity. Yes. Right? Yes. And since this gentleman, if he's an atheist, is not God, it is irrelevant what he thinks is right or wrong. So if I'm dealing with an atheist, I'll bring up a different argument, right? Yeah. But since I'm dealing with Muslim, I'm appealing to their external authority, the Quran, and they're condemning Muhammad and condemning the Old Testament. And I hope the Muslims see it. David, did you want to say something? No, You're I'm not just, really I'm... pulling your weight tonight, David, so I hope... Because I've been really pulling it all week. That's <laughs> why said, I got a bad he back. Said he, he said he needed the entire program to lay out one <laughs> argument. So, I mean, what... Uh, uh, yes, we're yes. going to take hate. the callers right now. We have a few. We've been having a little bit of technical difficulties. Let's see if it hasn't been cleared up. Let's take the next caller right now. Welcome. You're on the air with Jesus or Muhammad. Hello, um, it's me, it's Lewis again. Go ahead, um, Lewis. So, so since we're talking about violence in the Old Testament, I thought I'd plug in a resource that uh, everybody might uh, find extremely helpful. Sometime last year, uh, an apologist by the name of Paul Copen came out with a book Copen, called yeah. Is God a Moral Monster? Yes. Subtitled, Making yes. Sense of the Old Testament God. Exactly. I think the audience, anybody who's involved in dealing with Muslims ought to have this book because it deflates, I mean, it destroys all those arguments about the Old Testament be, being violent. Lewis, give and, us uh, the title, give us the title and the author's God, name again. Is God a Moral Monster by Paul, he pronounced it Co Copen, Paul you pronounce it Copen. Am I, mis am I mispronouncing the name? I don't know, Paul I thought I it was Copen, but here, David, who oh, is see. the English Dictionary. Or, is I've, a, I've always heard Copen. Copen, yeah. you know? Copen. Okay, yeah. very good. Like uh, Peter Pan, anyway, Copen? Anyway, uh, there's some really interesting insights in here. Um, for example, in one section, he points out that when the book of Joshua talks about um, killing Canadian. every man, woman, and child, that's not a literal statement. That's actually just a rhetorical device. And in fact, there might not even be women and children present in the area that's being attacked. Yep, I agree. Um, there's an excerpt here that's it's a couple of paragraphs long. It would take me about a minute to read it. Would it be okay with you if I... What, one minute, no problem. Is, uh, Go ahead. One minute American right. time, Louis. Not this Middle Eastern time. This Canadian is time. Pages Canadian time. 175 to 176 of the book. It says, okay. Joshua's language concerning Jericho and Ai appears harsh at first glance. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. 12,000 men and women fell that day, all the people of Ai. The average person isn't going to pick up on the fact that this stereotypical ancient Near Eastern language actually describes attacks on military forts or garrisons, not general populations that included women and children. There is no archaeological evidence of civilian populations at Jericho or Ai. Given what we know about Canaanite life in the Bronze Age, Jericho and Ai were military strongholds. In fact, Jericho guarded the travel routes from the Jordan Valley up to the population centers in the hill country. It was the first line of defense at the junction of free roads leading to Jerusalem, Bethel, and Orpah. That means that Israel's wars here were directed toward government and military installment. This is where the king, the army, and the priesthood resided. 
The use of women and young and old was merely stock ancient Near Eastern language that could be used even if women and young and old weren't living there. The language of all women and children at Jericho and Ai is a stereotypical expression for the destruction of all human life in the fort, presumably composed entirely of combatants. The text does not require that young, young men and old and women must have been in these cities. Okay, thank you, Louis. Th this is helpful, and, and I agree. I, th I think there is some truth there. And yet, once again, even if there were, there is still justice in that. But, but thank you. Sam, do you want to say uh, something? Well, actually, I, I, I just slipped my mind. Another objection they bring out against the Old Testament mm -hmm. is the passage in Numbers 31. But we can get to that later. Okay. And please help remind me to address it. Okay. It's in Numbers 31 where Yahweh orders the Israelites to <clears throat> kill mm -hmm. all the men and women of Moab and Median, but spare the virgins. Oh, okay. And they say, see, well, you know, look at these, oh, and I want to address that. So maybe after the calls, let me address it, because that's another passage that's distorted Very and perverted. Good. <clears throat> Very good. Lewis, thank you so much for pointing us uh, to that reference. Uh, many of us didn't know about that, and it uh, sounds like it's, it's good food for thought, and I think there's something good there. And yet, I, I want to reemphasize the fact that even if there are women and children in there, God is still just in what took place. Yep, amen. Biblically, God could destroy the entire world. Oh, absolutely. Save yes, Jesus. Yes. Because Jesus alone but is remember, holy Jesus and is righteous God, so. and without... Well, yeah. he is. Yeah. He yeah. is. So. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you so much. We got more callers. Shall we take a couple more? Sure. Let's you. go ahead and yeah. take the next caller right yeah. now. Welcome. You're on the air with Jesus or Muhammad. Hello. Hello. Yes, Welcome. Sir. Uh, this is Philip again, uh, Pastor Joseph. Go Philip right Thomas, ahead. How are you, buddy? Uh, you know, I, I, I said uh, earlier that uh, when Muslims attack the Bible... They're actually attacking their own Quran. Yes. Uh, because uh, we have overwhelming evidence in the Quran itself to prove the authenticity and uh, the textual purity of uh, the Holy Bible. Yes, yes, we have demonstrated uh, that. That's exactly right. Yes, uh, because I, I, uh, because the uh, 10th chapter, Surah Yunus, 94th verse, right. orders Muhammad to go to the Bible and clarify all his doubts. Yes, and by the way, Philip, just to remind our viewers, uh, he could not go to the Bible to do that unless the Bible that existed in his time was accurate and perfect. And of nice. course, we have <laughs> copies of the Bible from his time and even before his time, which yes. are the same as our Bible today, thus proving the exact yes. inerrancy and integrity of the scriptures we have, right? Yeah, I went to a British museum in London to see uh, the Codex Sinaiticus, mm -hmm. which was made in uh, 350 A.D. That is mm -hmm. almost uh, 250 years before uh, the Quranic so-called revelation came down to Muhammad. Yes, yes, And yes. I, I happened to see with my own eyes Codex Sinaiticus. And uh, also, you know, one more verse, a dynamic verse which you find in Surah Ma'idah, verse mm -hmm. 48, it says, the Bible, the Quran confirms and right. guards the Bible. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Right. Go yeah, ahead. Muhaymanin alayhi. Muhaymanin uh, alayhi. And what does that mean? Yes. Yeah. That is, to thee we sent the scripture in truth, yep. affirming the scripture that came before it and guarding it in its safety. Yeah. In, Little uh, translation, Philip. The little translation. Philip, yeah, it's a confirming. Uh, uh, Ibn Musaddas translation, son of a gun translation. <laughs> Ibn Musaddas, yeah. son of a gun. Yeah, and Philip, yeah. Amen. you know that the little yeah. translation, since you read the Arabic, the little translation doesn't say came before. It says confirming the scriptures between his hands. Uh, between his hands. Between yeah. his hands. Yeah. That means whatever Muhammad yeah. had access to, he confirms to be true. And yeah. then Muhammad. Yeah. Yeah. Baina hum bima anazzala. Allah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Keep going. And it's, yeah. it's musaddiqan lima baina yadayhi. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when such a, such a uh, verse is existing in the Quran, how Muslims can lie uh, yes, exactly. against the Holy Scripture? Yeah. yeah. Excellent point, Philip. Thanks you for uh, confirming and, what and I said earlier. And the Lord Jesus bless you. I heard, I heard the debate between Sam Shimon and uh, Nadir Ahmed. Yes. Once I heard, once I witnessed it, and Nadir Ahmed 
shamelessly uh, resorts to lies, I'm telling you. Yeah. Well, yeah. what are you going to do? Okay. Pray for his salvation by the grace of God. He needs Jesus because, again, even though we're talking about their lies and deception and winning debates, ultimately, Nadir is on his path to destruction unless he turns to Jesus Christ. He's lost eternally. eternally. He needs to turn to Jesus. May the Lord have mercy on him and save him from the wrath to come. Thank you, Philip. Lord bless you, brother. Yes. Thank you, <clears throat> Philip. Yes. God bless you. We have uh, a lot more callers. You all want to, uh, Brother Sam, you want to just address that because we are, the time is fleeting. Which Why don't one? you go ahead and address Numbers, Numbers 31. Oh, 31, I'll carry. Address yeah. that, <laughs> and then we'll get to our callers okay. who are waiting patiently. Uh, Titus 1.15 says, To the pure, all things are pure, but to the corrupt and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Their very minds and consciences are corrupt. Oftentimes, Muslims bring up Numbers 31, 17, 18 to try to uh, justify what chapter 4, verse 24 says. It's almost like the two quokey fallacy. Well, you too. <laughs> well, if this is evil, then your Old Testament is evil. What do I mean? In chapter 4, verse 24 of the Quran, it says that unlawful <clears throat> for Muslims to have sexual relations with are married women, mm -hmm. except those that your right hands possess. This passage is saying that if you go to war and you find captive women and you've taken them captive, you find women and you've taken them captive, you can actually have sex with them and sell them off as property, even if they're married and their husbands are still alive. Because this is such an evil, repulsive teaching, Muslims try to find something similar in the Old Testament and they think they found it. Numbers 31, 17, 18, let me read it. And again, I'm going to explain what it does not mean and what it means by looking at the immediate context by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what Numbers 31, 17, 18 says. Now therefore, God is telling Moses, kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman, now notice this, who has known man by lying with him. Kill all the women who are not virgins. But all the young girls who have not known man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. You see, God is saying keep all the virgins so that you can ravage them. That's what they say. However, I'm going to challenge all the Christians because some Christians, when they read this, they get troubled by it. What I want you to do is take a moment tonight to read Numbers 25, Numbers 31 in their entirety to see again this is an act of mercy and compassion on the part of God. What do I mean? Numbers 25 and 31 tells us that the Moabite, Midianite women mm -hmm. enticed the Israelites to commit fornication and worship of Baal. Mm -hmm. You with me? The women were enticing the Israelite men to have sex with them, pretty much for a lack of better terms, have orgies so to speak, mm -hmm. and worshiping their false god Baal. When God says, kill the women who have known man, that's not because he was sparing virgins for the Israelites to ravish. It's because these women were guilty in enticing the Israelites to sin against God. Mm -hmm. They were guilty. So God was condemning the guilty for mm -hmm. committing an act of sexual immorality and idolatry. So then why does he spare the virgins? Because the virgins did not entice the men to sin by committing sexual immorality mm. and worshiping Baal. So you see what's happening here, Joseph? Mm -hmm. Here God in his mercy spares the virgins because they were not guilty of the sin. Muslims read it as if it's the Quran and say, Ah, see, God is sparing virgins so the men can ravish them. Mm -hmm. That's not what the text says. This is an act of, um, of mercy on the part of God is saying these virgins who did not share in the guilt of the women who enticed my people to sin, spare them. So what turns out to be an act of mercy, they pervert it into something evil and filthy. Yeah, right. Moreover, another objection goes like this. How did they know they were virgins? After all, who told them? Hmm. Didn't they have to sleep with them? No. Again, read the context. Who is speaking to Moses? God. Here the context presupposes a supernatural encounter with God where God is speaking directly to Moses. Are you telling me God can't tell the virgins from the non-virgins and can't reveal it to the Israelites? They don't need to sleep with them sexually to know they're virgins. God could reveal that knowledge supernaturally to Moses and say, here they are, set them apart. And finally and more importantly, unlike the Quran, the Old Testament prohibits the Israelites from finding a captive woman and sleeping with her and selling her off. The Old Testament actually says that if an Israelite finds a captive attractive, mm -hmm. to give her one month to mourn the loss of her loved ones, and then marry her, not sleep with her, then sell her off. Let's read it. Deuteronomy 21, verses 10 to 14. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 21, verses 10 to 14. When you go out to war against your enemies, and Yahweh your God gives them into your hand, and you take them captive, and you see among them captives a beautiful woman, 
and you desire to take her to be your wife, not your property, not your slave that you sleep with, and you bring her home to your house, she shall shave her head and pare her nails, signs of mourning, mourning the loss of her loved ones. She shall take off the clothes in which she was captured, and she'll remain in your house and lament her father and her mother a full month. After that, you may go into her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. But if you no longer delight in her, you shall let her go where she wants. Notice, when you want to divorce her and she doesn't displease you because of something, you don't sell her as property. You let her go, give her a freedom. But you shall not sell her for money, nor shall you treat her as a slave, since you have humiliated her. Can I ask you, Joseph? Is this command similar to what we find in the Quran, where it says no. to Muslim men, take captive women, they're your property, sleep with them, yeah. sell them off, even if they're married? Right. Or is this vastly more humane, compassionate, merciful to captive women? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, have sex with as many slave women as you want. And this was revealed 2,200 years yeah. approximately before the birth of Muhammad. The Old Testament is vastly superior to the Quran. Glory to Jesus Christ. They go back, try to go back 2,800 years to find justification. And when they go back 2,800 years, 2,800 years, the Jews were ahead of the Muslims. Amen. In this, right? Years Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory yeah. to Jesus yeah. for his scriptures. Praise you, Lord. Maybe that's why 17 million Jews give these Muslims so many problems, because every time <laughs> something happens in the world, right? 1.5 billion Muslims are scared of 17 million Jews. I can't figure it out. Every time something happens, the Jews did it. 9-11, the Jews did it, you know, uh, whatever. The Jews did Well, I, I mean, hey, they're 2,800 years ahead of you. My goodness. All <laughs> right, excellent. We've got more callers. Why don't we take them right now? Hey, next caller, Jesus or Muhammad, you're on the air. Uh, hello, hi. Jesus yes, Muhammad. welcome. Uh, hello, hi. My name is Brent. Um, I'm actually from the Bahamas, and I'm just going to join the show, and I just want to... Just say that, you know, God is really using you guys, man. Amen. I Glory pray that, um, you know, Jesus keep, continues to bless y'all and, you know, just continue to be with y'all right now. So I'll try and, you know, be on the front line. Praise Amen. God. The question, I, the question I have for you guys is this. Usually when I'm talking to Muslims and we're, like, getting into, you know, any comparison between the Bible or, and, you know, and the Quran and, you know, Muhammad and Jesus, basically, you know, I get the same argument that I try to bring up the Hadith, you know, it's this idea that, you know, you don't need it. It's just the traditions of men, and you don't need it, and we don't need it for to understand the Quran. <laughs> and I haven't fully finished like reading the Quran personally. Mm -hmm. I was like, I know I've heard you say before, like some, especially say that there's verses that are completely like ambiguous without the uh, hadith. So I was wondering if you could just help me out in that. Okay, all right, guys. I understand. Excellent Thank question, you. brother. We cherish the prayers of all the saints. Please pr continue to pray for our ministries, for our families. Uh, for our testimony to grow to be more like Jesus in holiness and righteousness and to love him and to live for him, not just to be lip service, and also for the financial support that ABN and we need to continue to do this. So please pray for us. We need your prayers. We cherish the prayers of the saints of God. His question was, uh, he deals with some Muslims who say you don't need the Hadith. However, yeah. without the Hadith, the Quran is unintelligible. Right. You can't make heads or tails out of it. He wanted a few examples. And, My and pleasure. Just, Go ahead. Just, just to clarify, uh, how would an Orthodox Muslim, so 99% of Muslims, view someone who said, no hadith, just Quran? Oh, what would you be, what would you uh, yeah. be viewed as? Uh, a heretic, you'd be condemned by them because majority of Muslims believe that you need the Sunnah of Muhammad to make sense of the Quran. However, unfortunately, because Islam allows Muslims to use taqiyya, concealment, as well as deception, because Muhammad said war is deceit, khida, deceit. And they believe that the world is divided into two domains or houses. Darul Islam, Darul Har. The house of Islam, the house of war. So since the Muslims are outnumbered by the disbelievers in the West, they view this as Darul Har, the house of war. Therefore, they can lie to them because Muhammad said war is deceit. Yeah. So he actually may be meeting a Sunni Muslim who's saying, no, we don't need the Hadith. Yeah. In reality, if he's not ignorant of what his religion teaches, he's lying. He's using deception with impunity because God allows him to do so mm -hmm. until they get the upper hand. But in Jesus' name, they'll never get the upper hand because he sits enthroned as King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, he wanted a few examples. Brother, let me give you uh, two real quick. <clears throat> Actually, I'll give you three. Chapter 33, verse 37. And is he still on the line or is he off? You still with us, brother? I'm still there. Okay, okay, he's still there. And let me know if it makes sense to you. Chapter 33, verse 37, it talks about Muhammad telling someone named Zayed to keep your wife, even though Allah had ordained that Muhammad would marry Zayed's wife when he was finished with her. 
That's 33, 37. Number one, who is Zayd? Who is his wife? Why did Muhammad say keep her? And why is Allah so interested in getting them divorced? You will not find the answers to that question from 33, 37. You will not know who Zayd is without recourse to the Hadith. The Hadith tells you that's the, the adopted son of Muhammad who had married Zainab, Muhammad's cousin. And then Zainab started being attracted, you know, get attracted to Muhammad. And then Zayd wanted to divorce her so Muhammad could marry her. But he said, no, 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 keep your wife. All of those details are not found in that passage. You will not make sense out of that surah unless you have recourse to the Hadith. That's one example. Second example. This is the second example. The second example is chapter 30 of the Quran, <clears throat> verses 1 of 4. Chapter 30, verses 1 of 4, it says, <clears throat> if you read it, the Romans have been defeated in the lower part of the land. But in a few years, they shall be victorious. The Romans have been defeated in the lower part or the nearer part of the land. In a few years, they have been defeated. Number one, who defeated them? We don't know. The text doesn't tell us. Where were they defeated? The nearer or lower part of the land? Near what? Lower part in comparison to what? We're not told. When were they defeated? We're not told. We need to know when in order to see whether the prophecy occurred within the few years stipulated by the Quran. So we're not told who defeated them, where they were defeated, when they were defeated. So how can you say you go by the Quran alone? That's my second example. Before I give you the third one, did that make sense? You still there, brother? Okay, or he, okay. he's gone. Go All ahead. Right. Well, let me give you the third one. Surah 111. Surah 111. Yeah. Here in this surah, let me just read it. It's only four verses. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most, most merciful. Condemned are the works of Abu Lahab. Condemned is he. His money and whatever he's accomplished will never help him. He has incurred the blazing hell. Also his wife who led the persecution, she'll be resurrected with a rope of thorns around her neck. Who in the world is Abu Lahab? Who's his wife? What in the world did they do to get Allah so angry that he composed a surah condemning them to hell even before creation existed. Because don't forget, my brother, the Quran is the eternal speech of Allah. That means Surah 111 is an eternal surah condemning Abu Lahab and his wife to hell even before creation, even before they existed. What in the world was their crime to get Allah so upset that in eternity he condemned them, condemns them to hell? Without recourse to the hadith, you can't answer those questions. It's the Hadith that tells you Abu Lahab was Muhammad's uncle. When Muhammad told him that he's a prophet, he goes, may you perish. So Muhammad got angry and says, no, you'll perish and your wife. Nah. That's what he did. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, uh, excellent. Yeah. I, I mean, my goodness. Go ahead. Yeah. I uh, just wanted to add uh, one more very important passage, Surah 33, 21 of the Quran, which says that you have in Muhammad a beautiful mm -hmm. pattern of conduct. So yes. Muslims are told in Surah 33, 21 of the Quran that Muhammad is the pattern of conduct. Well, Sam, how much about Muhammad do you learn in the Quran? How much do you learn almost about Muhammad's no, life? Zero, yeah. yeah almost almost nothing. Almost yeah, like. nothing about Muhammad in the Quran. Where do you learn about Muhammad? You learn about Muhammad in the Hadith. So if uh, your, your Muslim friend is telling you the Hadith, uh, is that, that those are irrelevant teachings, well, then you can't even obey the Quran. You cannot obey the Quran's uh, command to, uh, to, to imitate the pattern of Muhammad without knowing about the life of Muhammad, but you can't know about the life of Muhammad without going to the Hadith. And on top of that, the name Muhammad only appears four times in the Quran, my brother. Only four times. All the rest of the references, when it's speaking of the messenger, it says, O prophet or messenger. How in the world can you prove that all those other references are speaking of Muhammad? When it says, O prophet, how do you know that's Muhammad? When it says messenger, how do you know that's Muhammad? It doesn't mention him by name except four times. So I can tell you that those surahs have nothing to do with Muhammad. It's speaking of some unknown prophet messenger that we know nothing about. Now, Prove me wrong from the Quran alone. You and, can't. And, and suppose, suppose, uh, suppose you pick a random surah of the Quran and I say, uh, I don't know who wrote this. I don't know where Precisely. it comes from. Sure. Where are you getting this from? I, yeah. How do I know who, go, who this, who, who this comes chronology. from, when it was written, yeah. uh, what the situation was, if it even goes, has anything to do with Muhammad? What do you say? You have to give some reference to the Hadith to say, oh, no, here's how we know the origin of this revelation. We're about to take a break, but one more thing, one of the five pillars of Islam of course, there's really six we know, but the, one of the five <laughs> pillars, uh, prayer. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. do pr five times a day? How do Muslims know mm -hmm. how to perform Even prayer? Zakat. Yeah, yeah. How much you give? And, and yeah. by, that, that's a, by the way, the, my, my our, our friend, that that is a great question to instantly ask your friend. Ah, we don't need the hadith. Tell me, how many times a day do you pray? The Muslim's going to say five times. 
Show me that in the Quran. Show me five times a day you pray Show according me where to the Quran. It specifies the particular times and the particular number of rakas that you get down Precisely. and the positions that you get into. Or how much zakat you're supposed to give. Right. You even and that you, you're not told. Or yeah. or the shahada. Show me the shahada. The, that's how yeah. you become a Muslim. Show me show exactly. us the shahada in the Quran. The point is, you can't know how to be a Muslim. You're you're told to imitate the pattern of Muhammad. You're told here are the five pillars, all this stuff. You can't know how to do any of that. The the basics of Islam you can't know from the Quran. The Quran just doesn't exactly. tell you. One more quick thing. Uh most Muslims that have any knowledge at all, uh have you ever noticed that when you speak to Muslims about some of the Old Testament prophets that are mentioned in the Quran? they automatically import some facts that are left out from the Quran from the Bible that helps them, exactly. uh, you know. Why do they yeah. do that? Because, because the Quran is incomplete, even though yeah. it claims to be complete. And we could talk about that later on, but you're right. Very good. You need we, the Bible to make sense out of it. We need to take a break. We'll be right back with our last segment of Jesus or Muhammad tonight. Callers, hold on. Hey, those who are out there, give us a call, 248-416-1300. We'll be right back after this.
Praise the Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Sam Shimon is not, and uh, neither am I. Our application for the Trinity, gentlemen, has been denied. But praise God, because uh, there is Father, Son, and Holy That's Spirit, right. not a black stone and a blasphemous prophet who isn't a prophet. Uh, so what were we talking about, after all? <laughs> we're talking about uh, Old Testament uh, violence. violence. I think the you've Old Testament. covered it, haven't you? Yeah, you've I mean, covered the only thing got... I have left is the Second Timothy 3, if we have time. But I think we do have callers, don't we? We do have callers. Let's take the next one right now. Welcome you on the air with Jesus or Muhammad. Uh, hi, brother. Hey, welcome. Uh, brother, uh, brother Yusuf, brother David, and brother... Brother Jaffer! <laughs> What's up, man? <laughs> What's going on? How are you, brother? I am, I am very proud of you guys. May the Lord bless you. Amen, am, in Jesus' name. I'm very thrilled uh, of the enthusiasm and the zealousness for, uh, for the Lord's name. Amen. It's really an awesome thing. And uh, uh, I would like to say a couple of things about the killing and also about uh, Nader Shabir. Uh, when they said that Sam, uh, he ran away. Uh, from the, the the debate, and he was defeated. I was there in that debate, and actually, Nader Shabir became a flat turkey. <laughs> and, and I was in that debate. I ha was reading the Quran with Sam, and then uh, how even even uh, one guy came and I was talking to Nader. One Muslim man came and told Nader, "I am ashamed of you." Because he told him, he told him why he said because today I was misrepresented uh, or uh, misrepresented, and you did not do a good job. Even the Muslims have shouted, they shouted at Nader, and they yep. told him leave yep. Sam alone, answer the questions. Mm. He was attacking Sam mm. personally. He doesn't know how to answer any question. Mm. So mm. Uh, then one thing, another thing about the killing. The killing in the Old Testament, as uh, you guys mentioned, it first of all is a judgment. It wasn't a command. In Islam, is a command. Exactly. And they are doing it exactly. until today exactly. against the Christians, against the people of the book, until today. And to them, is a privilege. And Muhammad, according to Quran, they had, they had, the Quran promised that who kills for the sake of Allah, is almost the, the only one is guaranteed to go to paradise. Uh, so, but in, in the Bible is a is another is another command, is exactly. a, is a judgment, and and historical things has happened that God to show us and to teach us about what happened in the in the Old Testament about these uh, Gentiles and heathens, and also as Sam mentioned that God was fair and just. He used to punish his own people when they used to go and worship idols. So it actually is a judgment, it's not a command. Mm. And here we see that what, what Muhammad brought, Muhammad to bring to humanity only misery and killing. Yes. And he put the Muslims until today, Muslims in, in, in hostility, uh, in hatred and envy, and, and with a, a, a high blood pressure, with other with other people, yeah. Muhammad only came just to kill people. And when you have a prophet saying that I came, I was commanded to fight the people, to kill the people until they declare La ilaha illallah and Muhammad this and that. So which God is this God? You are fighting who? You're fighting the Jews and the Christians who believe in the true God, and now your God is telling you to fight these people. That means your God is not the living God. Amen. And, uh, and, and that's here we see that the God of Islam, and as Sam mentioned in Surah, in Surah uh, uh, Maryam, uh, uh, chapter uh, uh, verse 71, when God actually said that all of you must, go through hell, right, and right. then we will rescue the righteous. Here we see that, as Sam said, if the Quran is being written in the reserved book, in the eternal, that means God has hated the human being and determined to take him to hell before he had created him and before yes, man falls exactly. into sin. That's right. This exactly. is the God of hatred yes. and the same mentality of Satan when he said, 
I swear by your majesty, I will send them all. I will, uh, I will tempt all of them. Tempt them for what? To send them to hell with him. So you have, you see here, the mentality and the heart of the God of Islam equals the heart of Satan who is determined to take a human being to hell. Thank what you, brother. We're going to have to, I'm sorry, I hate to cut you off, but we got some callers behind you Amen. and less about 15 minutes only. Thank you, dear brother, for those excellent insights. Just want to say real quickly, think about the uh, marching orders of Muhammad, right? Yes. Uh, you have this idea of let there be no religion in Arabia except Islam. But there's a passage in Surah Al-Baqarah I just want to bring up very quickly. Yes. Uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, verses chapter 190. Two. Yes, chapter 2, verses 190 to 193. Of course, the Muslim would be quick to take on the very first. It says, fight in the cause of Allah with those who fight you. But of course, mm. we know from the Dar al-Harb yes. and the Dar al-Islam, Essentially, anyone in Dar al Harb is considered to be fighting in a yes. sense. Because his fighting is not just physical, it can also be criticism. With the tongue. That's chapter 9, verse 12 of the Quran, just to confirm what I just said. Chapter 9, verse 12, and chapter 60, verse 2 says that a form of fighting Islam is to criticize Islam and Muhammad. That's right. also to spread mischief. Right. Some like to pronounce it mischief. Yes. Yeah, but well, that's yes. And 191, slay them, kill them, you know, ketalu. Uh, wherever you catch them, again, slay them. And then in verse 193, and fight them on until, until what? Until there the is religion. no until more they leave you alone. fitna, no more tumult yes. or oppression, and there prevail justice and faith in Allah. Yes. Am I wrong or am I exaggerating or resting the text to say essentially anyone, Anyone who fights against Muslims, whether it be physically with the hand or with the tongue, like we, uh, are. Well, like we are, Muslims are commanded to fight us yes. until we are completely obliterated in our opposition to Islam. Or at least subjugated. Yeah, subjugated. You said, you said obliterated in your opposition. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, yes. 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 Right. That's true. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, until the end. Until yes, exactly. the yeah, you, justice yes, and faith you're 100% prevail. You're right. It but, won't but, end until Jesus returns according to Islamic theology. But contrast right. that. To the Great Commission. Amen. You know, what does Jesus say? Jesus says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Now, therefore, you go, he's speaking to his disciples, but by extension to every Christian, right. you go and fight against the Muslims wherever you find them. No. no that's, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's David Wood's trick. No, <laughs> and that's a trick, brother. I like that <laughs> blonde wig, by the way. Yeah, but, is. anyways, no, you go, you make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. You don't care, you don't prick them with a sword or run them through you, you douse some water on them. And if you're a Baptist, praise God, you put them underneath. Hey, that's a question. Anyways, and then, right, Jesus says, Lo, I'm with you even unto the end of the age. Doesn't say kill anybody, doesn't say forcibly convert them. It says preach, make disciples, baptize until he returns and he'll always be with us. And can what I, a contrast. Can I give you another passage to confirm what you just said? Because someone Please. will say, well, there Jesus doesn't say what happens if they reject. <laughs> oh, the Great okay. Commission, right. and refuse to become a disciple of the Lord Jesus. Well, you sure. know what? We don't need to leave it to guesswork. Let's quote Jesus Christ, Shake where he gave, gave similar instructions to disciples when he yes. sent them two by two. Yes. Luke chapter 10, verses 5 to 12. This mm -hmm. is what I was going to speak about good. when understanding the Old Testament relationship to the New Testament. Very we good. know those commands were for Israel, a specific time, a specific group. They were descriptive, describing what happened back then. They're not commands for Christians living under the New Covenant. Right. How do I know? Here is proof, Luke 10, verses 5 to 12. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide. For the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town mm -hmm. and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets, slay them, behead them, rape their no, women? No, no. No. Go into the, to its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Mm. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. And now notice verse 12. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. You understand what that means? You went there, you preached, they rejected you. Wipe the dust off your feet have nothing to do with the town, don't attack them, don't kill them, because on the day of judgment, they'll be called into account 
yes. when Jesus comes. Yes. On that day, it will be more bearable for Sodom than for that town. Mm. So we have no right, no command from Christ to force people to become Christ, uh, Christians or subjugate them and humiliate them if they refuse to but, do so. But, but Paul said that we war according to the flesh. No, no he didn't. No, he didn't. Second Corinthians 10, 3 to 6, he Bible. goes, We don't war according to the flesh, and our weapons are not fleshly, but mighty in the heavenly realm. I'm sorry, it's not, it's not quite 10. like that, actually, yes. but it's King James. Yeah, you need to I'm sorry. I'm going by <laughs> NIV, we walk not in the flesh, version. We're not after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Yes, that's militant Muslims. Yes, Can I'm militant, but version? spiritually militant. Oh. Oh, Chuck, that's King James. You remember? Can, give no, me the NIV. NIV is wrong. Yes, anyway, yes. the Muslims, that's the, that's the Muslims the, will tell us which version how many versions that's of the npj of the, version the new, the new pastor joseph <laughs> listen 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 luke luke chapter 9 once more to to bas to uh to undergird and to come alongside of what sam just said remember this muslims jesus this this is really telling luke chapter 9 uh, verse 51 and following, it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. That's Jesus. 52, and he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, Wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? You know, it's interesting that the companions of Muhammad never asked Muhammad a similar question. Yeah, I wonder have, why. They don't have that. They have authority. no faith that Muhammad could do something like that. that. But Jesus could. Uh, but guess what? Listen to Jesus' response. It's so sublime. It's so beautiful. You'd never expect Muhammad to say this. But then again, you never expect his companions to ask him something like this because he couldn't. He never would. And Jesus turns and rebukes them, verse 55. He rebuked them. He said, you know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to do what? Yes. To save Amen. them. That's awesome. Praise God forevermore. We have two callers. We have little time. Shall we try to take both of them real quickly? Little time is calling you? We, we, little time. <laughs> Go ahead, little time. You're on yeah. the... Let's yeah. take the next caller right now. Welcome you on the air with Jesus or Muhammad. Hello. Hello. Welcome. We have just a brief amount of time left. If you would, be concise. I'm not taking your time. I just want to say I love you guys and God bless you. And Amen. I pray for you guys that God is with you. Amen. Thank you. Thank and you. I need you to pray for my son. Yes. The name Joseph Sula. Let him hear you. Joseph and Mother Brother David and Simon, I pray for you. Amen. And the last time you talking about Muhammad, uh, ugly Jesus or oh, ugly? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Mah uh, Islam is ugly. <laughs> uh, did you say Jesus your son's is name is, is Joseph? <laughs> yeah, my son is named Joseph. So we to pray name. for him. Anything particular? Uh, he accepted God when he's a little, but now he's a teenager. Yeah. And you know that's going on now for the world. Okay. And I want you to pray for him very hard. We Sister, let's just give Joseph. you some encouragement. When Excuse I became me? a teenager, I fell away and did things I'm ashamed of. In Jesus' name, the Lord didn't forsake me, didn't abandon me, waited patiently and drew me back to him by his spirit. So he Praise will draw God. your son back. Just don't stop praying. The Lord loves your son more than you do. We'll close in prayer in just a few minutes. Stay tuned and we'll pray for Joseph as well as other prayer requests that are tugging on our heart tonight. Let's take the last caller right now. Uh, go right ahead. You're on the air with Jesus or Muhammad. Yeah, uh, uh, Reverend uh, Joe. Yes, sir. Your servant. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. My name, my name is Dave. Yes, Dave. And um, you guys are just fantastic, the three of you, when you're together. Amen. Uh, Glory to Jesus. Pr pr pray for us that, that, that we can get well, on MSNBC. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, the, uh, the, uh, you, you, the, the service you do is phenomenal. I, I wish I had your courage, too. I don't have your courage to come out publicly and, and speak like you do, but I do have some money. I'm going to send you some more money. I sent some Amen. before. Thank you, send another donation because you guys need the money. Yes, Thank we you, desperately do. But again, God is good. He works through his church like people like you. And the Lord bless you and embolden you because he that is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And the Lord hasn't given you a spirit of fear, right? So just claim it because Christ is alive and he'll use you mightily. Just take a step. He, he lives. 
And the beauty is that he lives in you by his spirit. Let me quickly say, dear brother, take this opportunity. We thank you so much Amen. for your support of ABN. It's very important, very necessary. And in addition, not just you, but for everyone, just so you know, uh, ABN does need your support, absolutely. These two brothers in Christ have their own ministries. Can you please just tell quickly your yes. websites? Yes. And, yes. of course, they also have their own support needs. Yes. Go yeah. right ahead. De and again, ABN and David and myself are in desperate need of God's grace to work through the people of God to support us financially. You know, we don't have big donors that contribute monthly. We trust by the grace of God every month for him to pay our bills, and we trust in him. He's a good God, and he'll never leave nor forsake us. David writes for his blog, AnsweringMuslims.com. AnsweringMuslims.com. There you'll find blog articles and debates that David and others have. Uh, we both write for the website, Answering Islam. It's uh, answering-islam.org. Answering-islam.org. And also, uh, Act17.net. Am I correct? That's the URL. Act17.net is also the, uh, the ministry that we're involved in. Pray for these ministries. Pray for our families. Pray for our children, our wives. Pray for our support to do this for the glory of Jesus Christ because he's worthy. Amen. Amen. Brother Dave, a uh, quick comment or question before we sign off tonight? Oh, he's gone. Okay. Thank you so much, Dave, for calling, for your encouragement, for your prayers, and especially for your support that is much needed. Well, uh, we don't have time to take any more callers, but we do have about five minutes left in the program. What's the summation? Uh, Brother you David, you haven't, summation? you haven't said much at all, yes. and so we'd like you now to try to contribute <laughs> at least something to this program before we go to King <laughs> Sam to finish up. No, go ahead and, and share with our viewers. What do they need to get out of this? I mean, yeah, what's the, the point real point? This, Let's bring it back to that. Well, well, well there, are, there are a couple things, but uh, one... Um, I think it was Philip who said that when Muslims uh, attack the Bible, they're attacking their own scriptures. Yes. And that's not just on the issue of violence. That's on the issue of anything. Since the Quran affirms uh, the Torah and the gospel, anything you attack in the Torah and the gospel uh, is an attack on your own religion, not just mm. ours. Mm. Uh, so if you criticize the Old Testament, you've just criticized your own prophet. If you criticize the deity of Christ or uh, Jesus' death by crucifixion or Jesus' resurrection from the dead or... Uh, the idea that God loves uh, everyone mm. or that we call God Father, or that God is a trinity. If you criticize any of that, you're criticizing your own book. And I know Muslims are thinking, what do you mean? The, 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 Quran, the Quran says Jesus didn't die. The Quran yeah. says God is not a trinity. How could I be criticizing your own book? That's, what your, that's the situation your prophet left you in. Mm. Your prophet left you in the situation of confirming our scriptures uh, and yet denying all the doctrines that are in our scriptures. And that, mm. that, that means that your system simply self-destructs. It also means that if you want the truth, you have to look somewhere other than Islam. And there are lots of things that are uh, great about Christianity. There are things that uh, you would like about Christianity. Uh, if, if you're, if you're uh, a moral person, there are teachings you would look at in Christianity and say, wow, that's really nice. Wow, it's really great that, uh, that in Christianity you're told to love everyone and to harm no one. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you become a Christian because Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, Amen. and his, that means if we're going to listen to anyone tell us about God, you listen to Jesus. And Amen. so you, you, you don't go to Muhammad, you don't, no. go to, you don't go to Buddha, you don't go to any, yeah. anyone except for the guy who rose from the dead. And they, the they're Lord not Jesus talking Christ. too much anymore, by the way, Buddha and Muhammad. It's no, hard no. to hear them. Go ahead, they're Brother actually, well, <laughs> Thank you, David. Well, uh, the only thing I can say is that David is 100% right. Christ is risen, the tomb is empty, he is Lord. And because of that, Jesus says, because I live, you will live also. Amen. And in John 6, 57, that was John, actually, that was John chapter 14, verse 19. But in John 6, 6 57, our Lord says this, <clears throat> just as the living Father sent me and I live because of him, he who feeds on me will live because of me. Mm. In the context, the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about spiritually feeding on him. Yes. By coming to him by faith and believing in his word, trusting that he is risen, he is Lord, and he will perfectly preserve us by his all-powerful word, the same all-powerful word that Hebrews 1.3 says he uses to sustain all creation, and that means Muslims, Jesus is sustaining you, the breath you breathe, breathe is his grace to you, and you must acknowledge him, and we pray you do, because when you do, you will live forever in his presence, in perfect love, fellowship, and happiness. Hallelujah. And that's our prayer for you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Brother Sam. Thank you, Brother David. Sorry I was hard on you tonight. I was just trying to hear you laugh. I love you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. I just want to say one final note as we sign off. You know, what, what hits me about all of this thing is, is the fact that death, 
death entered the world through sin. Yes. You know, you've got Adam falling even in, in Islam, and death is required, and, and there's these killings, and, and the death of those Amorites was because of their sin, and there was this continuous killing, and you go back to the Old Testament, the shed, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin, and hundreds of thousands, yes, even millions of animals, their blood was shed in the Old Testament because there was still not satisfaction of exactly. sin in front of God, and that covering was never enough. And But we see that Jesus Christ, God came in the place of us who would truly believe on Him. Amen. And his, his death is the perfect satisfaction. It says in the Quran, We ransomed Him with a mighty sacrifice, referring to the son of Abraham, referring to for Kibsh, a ram. Is a ram a mighty sacrifice? Yeah. Can God ransom a human with a ram? Well, my goodness, he can ransom the whole world, everyone who would believe with his son Jesus, whose the blood is of God. infinite value. There was no way to stop this cycle of death, this cycle of killing that must take place, for the wages of sin is death, and God is not mocked. A man will reap whatever he has sown, except that God would come and fill in the gap, for no one is righteous, no, not one. All are born in sin, including Muhammad. Yes, especially Muhammad, but Jesus... Jesus Christ alone, virgin born, sinless, lived the perfect life, took the wrath that you and I deserve. He became that sacrifice for sin, and now there's no need for you to fear death, but you may pass from death into life. You will not die, but have everlasting life if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. It's true for Sam Shimon. It's Amen. true for David Wood. Praise God, it's even true for dumb old Pastor Joseph. Mm -hmm. Is it true for you tonight? Is it true? Make sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior tonight. Don't go to bed without Him because you may, not, you may wake up without Him forever and you will be in everlasting hellfire and you will know nothing but death, spirit, soul, and body. May it never be so except the Lord tonight. Good night. God bless each and every one.